Dead America, the second month, Atticus on the Rails, part four, written by Derek Slayton, narrated by Aaron Smith. Chapter one, day zero plus 45, rebuild day 15. Atticus screamed down the highway in hot pursuit of the fleeing vehicle. Mere minutes had passed since the confrontation in the small town of Wallace with a band of deserters. At least, he assumed they were deserters, but regardless, they had not only tried to kill him, but had kidnapped a civilian. He wasn't alone in his pursuit either, with a young and capable woman in the passenger seat. She checked her sidearm as they tore down the highway, not having said a word since the chase had begun. So, you going to tell me who you are? he finally asked. Name's Madison, she replied tersely. Okay, that's a start, at least, he drawled. It's nice to meet you, Madison. Now, if it's not too much trouble, you mind filling in some of the blanks? Because I know why I'm following him, but I'd really like to know why you are. Why are you following him? she asked. I tend to take it personally when people shoot at me, he said dryly. Your turn. So you're really not here to do something about them? She accused. Ma'am, I still have no idea what's going on here, he admitted. It's like I told you. I was sent here to investigate the communications going down in North Platte. Everything else is just rumors and what I've seen with my own eyes, which isn't much. She looked Atticus up and down, giving him a good long look before nodding. Okay, I'm going to take you at your word, she finally declared. Don't make me regret it. I'll do my best, the ex-ranger promised. I suppose we should start at the beginning, she said with a sigh. He grinned. I got this thing floored and we're barely gaining on them, so we got time, he said, and kept his focus on the road even as they chatted. I'm an agent with the agency, Madison said, and it was vague enough that he couldn't help but laugh. Which one? he asked. Does it matter? She shot back. Guess not, he admitted, shaking his head. So, you're an agent. Go on. I had been undercover for eighteen months just outside of Kansas City when all this broke out, she explained. Over the first few weeks of this, my mission changed several times. Ultimately, though, it was to gather intel on the growing threat of deserters from the military. Atticus cocked a brow. So, there were enough of them to warrant an agent looking into them? He asked. She nodded. There were warning signs early on, with morale from a lot of the rank and file taking a significant hit, she confirmed. They weren't particularly pleased about being forced to retreat away from their family and friends. The Kansas City debacle poured gasoline into the fire. Kansas City debacle? Atticus asked. She rolled her eyes. You ever had a manager who couldn't tell the difference between their ass and a hole in the ground? She asked. I was a Texas Ranger. Ran into more than my share of brass who fit that description, he quipped. Now, imagine that on a war footing, she continued. Instead of being stuck with extra paperwork, you have thousands of soldiers dead and a colossal fuck-up big enough to endanger the entire mission. That would certainly qualify as a debacle, he agreed. The debacle radicalized a lot of people, but none more than Captain Bennett, Madison explained. After surviving Kansas City, he started going rogue, forging his own path. It was not difficult for him to recruit others to his cause. How many are we talking? Atticus asked. She took a deep breath. I don't have firm numbers, she said vaguely. Dozens, he tried. She scoffed and shook her head. Hundreds, she said, quite possibly into the thousands. So, they really have an army of, well, trained soldiers, Atticus said, puffing out his cheeks and letting out a low whistle. Lots of civilians, too, Madison added. His brow furrowed. Willing participants? he asked. My guess is no, she replied dryly. Is that why they took your friend up there? he asked. Doubtful, she replied. 
The group I'm with have been fighting with them for weeks now. If I had to guess, they're going to extract information from him if they get the chance. Let's make sure they don't, Atticus said, and swore he got another tiny bit out of the gas pedal, even though it was on the floor. It didn't increase the speed, but it felt like the effect was good. Do you know where their base is? he asked. They have several, but the closest to us would be Holdredge, she replied. How far is that? Atticus asked. Eighty miles or so, she said. He looked down at the speedometer. He was going well over a hundred miles an hour. Well, at this pace, we have less than an hour, he said. Madison looked out the window as they passed a road sign that said, Curtis, two miles. She immediately began hunting around the cab, locating his hunting rifle with a scope and checked it. What are you planning on doing with that? Atticus asked, curiosity raising his brow. Curtis was a diversion town when the military was evacuating, she replied. He blinked at her. Diversion town? he prompted. While they were here, they did their best to take out the zombie threat as much as possible, at least in Kansas, she explained. Up here in Nebraska, they felt it was a waste of manpower and bullets to continue to do so. So they set up loudspeakers and blasted music to draw those things in. The music lasted for weeks, long after they had evacuated. Being this far out in the middle of nowhere, there hasn't been a lot of things to pull them away from town. Which means he's going to have to slow down and go off-road, Atticus said with a nod, picking up what she was insinuating. She grinned. And when he does, she began. We can disable the vehicle, Atticus finished. You any good with that? She checked the mag and clicked it into place. Seventh in my class at the academy, she said. I was third in mine, he quipped. She cocked a brow. How big was your class? she asked. Fifty-seven, he declared. Cute, she replied. Mine was seven hundred and eighty. He laughed. As a gentleman, I'll defer to you for the shot, he said but the competitor in me would like to politely request a shoot-off once we survive the day. She chuckled. You just better have something worthwhile to play for, she warned. I'd hate to wipe the floor with you and not get anything nice. Atticus couldn't help imagining exactly what nice things he would love to provide her for the win, but it was back to work mode, because the vehicle ahead of him was letting off the gas. He did the same, looking past at the dark figures on the road ahead. There were some makeshift barricades that had been set up, almost like a maze that made it easy for the creatures to get into town, but difficult to get out. That didn't matter at the moment, though, only that the vehicle ahead had gone off-road, running alongside the town. There was a huge residential area just off of the highway, stretching for a couple of miles or so. You tell me when, Atticus said. Madison rolled down the window, pulling up the rifle and pointing it out. A moment later, she calmly instructed, Stop. He slammed on the brakes, and the truck came to a violent, skidding halt. It took a moment for her to get her bearings, but she managed, spending a few seconds tracking the enemy vehicle as it ran along the barren ground before finally firing. The shot took a brief moment to find its target, punching the front passenger side wheel. The tire exploded and sent the car weaving around as the driver struggled to regain control. A few seconds later, they watched as it careened into the neighborhood, vanishing behind some houses. Madison pulled the rifle back into the vehicle, giving Atticus an I-told-you-so look. He smirked and nodded. That's some fine shooting there, ma'am, he admitted. Gonna have to up my game if I'm gonna have a chance at that shoot-off. First things first, she said, holding up a hand. Let's get my man out of harm's way. Yes, ma'am, Atticus agreed, and popped the truck into gear, flooring it. He went off-road and sped alongside the neighborhood portion of the town, following in the tire tracks of the deserter. He stopped about thirty yards shy of where the vehicle went into the neighborhood. They looked ahead at the tire tracks cutting through the grass of the corner house on the road. They studied it for a brief moment, seeing if there was movement from zombies or anything else, but saw none. You see the vehicle? he asked. Madison shook her head. No, just the tracks, she replied. Looks like they stop at the road. 
Get you a rifle ready, he instructed. I'll drive into the neighborhood and see what we can see. We should go on foot, she said. Going to be safer if he set up an ambush for us. Even on a busted wheel, he can put some distance between us, and in a hurry, Atticus countered. If he's not on this block, we're going to have a race against the clock. It's your man, so it's your call. She took a sharp breath, thinking for a beat before finally nodding in agreement. It was definitely more dangerous to drive right down the street, but time wasn't something that was on their side. You just be ready to gun it if he opens fire, Madison warned. I've survived too much to be taken out by a backbencher in Wallace, Nebraska. Atticus chuckled and nodded. You and me both, he agreed. He hit the gas, and they started driving slowly, across the yard to get into the neighborhood as the road dead-ended. A few blocks down, they could see movement, dozens of zombies shambling about, some coming in their direction, it would appear, drawn by the noise. They scanned the houses and yards, looking for signs of the enemy vehicle. Tracks, two o'clock, Madison said. She pointed to her right, a few houses up, and there were tracks through the front yard, with one large divot on one side where the rim of the vehicle dug into the ground. However, there was no sign of the vehicle, the tracks vanishing around the side of the house. Get ready, Atticus said. She aimed an assault rifle out the window, her finger in the firing position. Just give me something to shoot at, she said. Before they could get to the other side of the house, a shot rang out, shattering the side mirror beside Madison. He didn't wait for another shot to go off, just floored it, cutting hard to the left to get away from the gunfire. She managed to squeeze off a few shots, but they didn't hit anything as the force of the acceleration altered her shot too much. A few more bullets came their way, one cutting through the back window and a couple more clanging off the back tailgate. Atticus drove towards the house that was diagonally across from the house where the vehicle was abandoned and where he believed the shots were coming from. There were no cars in the driveway and the garage door was down. The shots continued to come their way and he sped up as he got into the driveway. Hang on, he yelled. She braced for impact as Atticus plowed through the garage door, causing major damage to it. The metal door was bent upwards and pushed into the garage, which was luckily empty. The force of the truck was enough to get them inside the structure, providing some cover. Move, 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 he barked, reaching down and grabbing a hunting rifle as she exited the other side of the truck with the assault rifle in hand. He was in such a hurry that his hat got knocked off in the process, and he didn't seem to notice or care. I got eyes. You clear the house, she cried. Copy, he shot back and headed off. She took up position by the back of the truck, aiming her rifle towards the house where the enemy vehicle was. She scanned the window of the house, trying to find one that was open or disturbed. There were several that had been broken out. Come on, pop your head up just once she murmured. Finally, she spotted the subtlest of movements in the window at the corner of the house, and she didn't hesitate, pulling the trigger. It wasn't great aim, but it managed to hit the side of the house, which caused the blinds to fly up as something caught it. I know where you are now, she muttered, and you aren't getting away. As she kept a close eye on the house across the way, Atticus rushed in through the garage door, his revolver drawn and the hammer cocked back. He knew ammunition was at a premium, but he also knew this was no time to be conservative. As soon as he emerged into the kitchen, he could hear moaning coming from within the house. There was one zombie near the dining room table, tangled up on the chairs. He took quick aim and fired, nearly taking its head completely off. There was still moaning and noise coming from the back of the house, and he moved quickly towards it. The master bedroom was shut, and he could hear thrashing about inside. He paused for a brief moment, putting his ear to the door to see if there was anything he could determine. Moans and thrashes and bangs echoed inside, but no footsteps. He readied himself, turning the knob and throwing open the door, ready for battle. He blinked down at the sight before him. The zombie was what once had been a middle-aged female, her wrists tied to the bedposts, spread eagle. She thrashed about, her skin showing some major decomposition, 
but no bite marks as far as she could see. Damn, been like that since the start, he murmured, and either she'd been having a really bad time or a really good time at the end of the world. He aimed his gun and fired, ending the poor creature's existence, before listening hard to try to get a read on any other movement inside the house. There was nothing. Clear, he yelled. He worked his way back towards the garage, and Madison flew out, making a beeline for the front of the house, taking up a position by the window. She used the butt of the rifle to smash out one of the panels to clear her firing spot. Guessing you got something, Atticus said dryly. Get over here. Stay to the side of the window, she instructed. Not my first gunfight, he quipped, though he followed her instructions and took up position on the other side of the front windows. All right, walk me through it. They're set up in the house across the street, Madison explained. He tried to take a shot at me from the corner window, but I gave him a good scare. Doubt he's going to do that again. Atticus nodded. What's the game plan? he asked. If he's smart, he has reinforcements on the way, so time isn't on our side, she said. And with all the noise we've been making, those things will be moseying our way too, he added. He's got a hostage in tow, she mused. So unlikely they're going to be moving from house to house, just circling the wagons and waiting for the cavalry. Atticus nodded. Frontal assault isn't my preferred way to go, he said. Me either, Madison agreed. He inclined his head. You hold the front while I flank him? he asked. She nodded slowly. Could work, she said. I give you some cover fire so you can get across the street a few houses down. Keep him focused on me. Once I get inside and neutralize him, I'll give you a signal, Atticus added. She nodded again, more agreeable as the moments went on. And then I'll come pick you two up, and we'll get the hell out of Dodge, she said. So nice working with a professional, the ex-ranger said brightly. You got to a count of thirty before I start shooting, so you better get a move on, she said sharply, and they exchanged a nod. Atticus made a run to the back door, rushing outside and stopping in the backyard to look towards the heart of the neighborhood. Dozens of ghouls made their way towards them, still a couple of blocks away from the front edge. He knew that time wasn't on their side, so he snapped back into the moment, rushing the opposite direction towards the edge of town. He didn't bother pausing at the edge of the house, hoping that he would get lucky and not be spotted. He didn't hear any gunfire coming his way as he got to the house next door, and breathed a sigh of relief as he continued to pump his legs. A few houses down, he moved around to the front but stayed concealed at the corner. He looked back towards the target house, and the windows facing him still appeared to be intact. If he did see me, he isn't concerned about me, he thought and smirked to himself. He should be, though. He caught his breath, waiting on the diversion fire to begin. It didn't take long before the fireworks started up, because instead of firing a few shots, she went crazy, lighting up the front of the house with a barrage of bullets. Atticus instinctively broke out from cover, running straight across the road, hoping that the covering fire would do its job. He made it to the house across the street, three down from the target house. He looked back up the road, finding the mob of ghouls continuing to march his way. No time to waste, he huffed, and ran through the backyards of the houses towards the deserter and his hostage. There was a clear exchange of gunfire, so he knew the man was distracted. He made it to the house, drawing his revolver and going up to a window at the side of the house. He peeked inside, not seeing anybody in the back bedroom. He lifted the window, surprised to find it unlocked. He holstered his weapon and climbed inside, trying to be careful, but landing hard on the bed, creating some noise. He hesitated with a grimace, hoping he hadn't just given himself away. Another few shots went off in the front room, so he was hopeful that he was in the clear. He still had his revolver drawn, hammer cocked back as he made it to the bedroom door. He slowly and quietly opened it but it was an older door and creaked a little. Damn it, he thought, and knew he had to move immediately, so he flung the door open and rushed down the hallway to the front room. The wounded hostage sat in the recliner in the middle of the room, facing him. He was bound and gagged, but
but made eye contact with Atticus and began to shake his head violently. The ex-ranger caught on to this as he got to the end of the hallway, and as soon as he crossed the threshold, a glint of metal caught the corner of his eye, and he instinctively jerked his head backwards. As he did, a deafening boom ripped through the air as a gun a couple of feet from his head went off, the bullet barely missing his head. The deserter fired a few more times, bullets ripping through the cheap drywall of the hallway. Atticus returned fire, sending a few bullets back his way. Atticus laid low, coming out from the hallway just as the former soldier emerged from the side. The ex-ranger lowered his shoulder, planting it into the man's stomach and driving him back. They stumbled, slamming right into the hostage with enough force that it flipped the chair over. As they hit the ground, both guns dislodged, scattering across the floor. Both men scrambled to their feet and got into a fighting position. The former soldier was a large white man, not bodybuilder type, but muscular. He didn't speak, rather lunged towards the cowboy, swinging a haymaker in his direction. Atticus managed to smack it aside and counter with a gut punch. The man was undeterred, throwing his head back and slamming his forehead into the bridge of Atticus's nose. This staggered the ex-ranger a bit, causing him to stumble back, taking a brief moment to gather himself from the hit. As he did, he saw the former soldier looking around on the ground for his handgun, spotting it and reaching down for it. No, you don't, Atticus huffed and rushed forward, tackling him just as his fingertips grazed the metal. Atticus managed to yank him away from the weapon, the two of them headed towards the front window. Atticus's body slammed into the glass, cracking it. The ex-soldier gripped his throat, trying to strangle him. Atticus struggled to free himself, but the man was too strong, so it was time to fight dirty. He jammed his thumb hard into the deserter's eye, pushing hard, and his opponent screamed in agony. After a few seconds, finally letting go of his throat and staggering backwards, Atticus took a moment to regain his breathing before rushing towards the man, who seemed to be struggling to get his sight back in his wounded eye. The ex-ranger swung across his body, going for the knockout shot, but the warrior blocked it and stumbled back a few more steps into the kitchen. Atticus pursued, but the man was able to retaliate by flinging a vase off of a counter in his direction. He got into a defensive position as the glass shattered on his arm, giving the former soldier an opening to dart forward, leaping into the air and coming downwards with an elbow. The move connected with the top of Atticus's head, staggering him. The deserter stepped forward, grabbing Atticus by the shirt and flinging him backwards into the kitchen. Atticus slammed down onto the table, flipping over it and landing hard on the floor. The warrior looked around the kitchen for a weapon as the ex-ranger peeled himself off of the ground, finally spotting a knife block. He ripped out the biggest butcher knife in the set as Atticus got to his feet. Gonna be like that, huh? he asked. The man didn't respond, rather marched towards him with the knife in striking position. Atticus stood there as the danger got closer, and as the man began to stab, he lifted up a chair to use as a shield. The force of the impact to the back of the chair was enough to shove the blade completely through it, narrowly missing him. Without missing a beat, he shoved the chair to the side, disarming the man as the knife stuck in it. He immediately went back on the offensive, finally landing a punch to the man's head, which seemed to barely impact him. The two exchanged some blows, both of them were able to deflect them to some extent with minimal damage to either of them. Finally, the ex-soldier managed to break through with a haymaker that even blocked, forced Atticus to stumble into the next room. As soon as he regained his footing, Atticus looked up at the ex-soldier rushing towards him. He backed up, staggered from the impact of the last punch. The deserter leapt up into the air, leading with his knee, planting it directly into Atticus's chest. The full force of the blow knocked the wind out of him as he flew into the front windows. Between the force and his weight, he crashed through them and onto the grass of the front yard, landing hard on his back. As he struggled to regain his breath, moans echoed, far too close for comfort. He turned his head, finding dozens of feet within a few yards of him. Atticus was in a lot of pain, struggling to get to his feet, but the excited moans did a good job of motivating him to get up. As he dragged himself across the yard, the ex-soldier appeared in the window, 
but before he could aim and fire, shots rang out from across the street. The bullets hit the house, forcing him back behind cover and giving Atticus a chance to escape. The bullets continued to fly, dropping several zombies that were getting close to Atticus as he got to the road. There were about sixty or so zombies in the general area, all of which seemed very interested in him. To complicate the situation, tires screeched in the distance. He looked down the road as he hobbled across it, and a trio of SUVs screamed around the corner, barreling towards him. Their engines revved and picked up speed, and someone leaned out the window, opening fire towards him. Thankfully, they were far enough away that the aiming wasn't accurate, but it was enough to make him move with haste. As the zombies continued to pursue him, and the incoming fire intensified, he looked up just as Madison emerged from the house, standing on the porch and sending several rounds towards the oncoming vehicles, forcing the shooter back into the cab. Get in here, she barked. Atticus burst into the house as the vehicles ran through the zombies in the yard outside the other house. Madison popped off a few more shots as they took cover inside. Atticus slammed the door shut behind them as bullets flew their way, shattering the glass. The two of them stayed on the ground as the bullets continued shredding the front of the house. So it didn't go well, huh? Madison asked dryly. I've had better fights, Atticus huffed. Amazingly not the first time I've been thrown through a window. First time you lost your gun, though, she asked, inclining her head towards his holster. He looked down at the empty thing, shaking his head. Sadly, yes, he said. You'd better get a weapon, because I don't think they're going to leave us alone, she warned. Atticus crawled back towards the garage as Madison popped up and sent a few more bullets towards the gunman. She managed to stay up long enough to see the situation. Three of the deserters came towards them in an attack formation, taking turns firing while the other two vehicles loaded up the prisoner and their man. She fired a few more times, hitting one of the oncoming attackers in the leg, dropping him to the ground. Before she could be too pleased about it, though, they called out and another came and took his place as the wounded hobbled back to the SUVs. Atticus got to his feet and made it to the garage, rushing the truck. He threw open the door, reaching in and grabbing his hunting rifle, as well as his spare handgun on the seat. Before he could fully come out of the cab, bullets hit the truck. They shredded the back tires and forced him to dive back into the cab, quickly working his way through it and out the other side. He hit the ground hard, rolling over and taking aim with his hunting rifle and firing. It was a tough shot, just grazing one of the gunmen, who turned his full attention towards him and opened fire. Atticus was pinned down, chambering another round when he looked back and saw one of the ex-soldiers reaching to his waistband and pulling out a grenade. You gotta be kidding me, Atticus muttered as the man pulled the pin and lobbed the grenade towards the garage. He scurried to his feet, running around the front of the truck as bullets flew. He leapt through the door, yelling as he flew through the air. Fire in the hole, he cried, hitting the ground hard as the grenade went off. Shrapnel from the truck crashed through the walls, narrowly missing him as bullets continued to pepper the front of the house. We gotta move, he yelled. And go where? Madison cried back. Deeper into the neighborhood, he suggested. You want to run towards the zombies? she demanded. I'd rather fight them than guys with grenades, he argued. She popped up, firing a few more shots out the window in frustration, because she knew he was right. She stayed low and made a break for the kitchen where he was up and headed to the back door. They threw open the doors and ran outside, where a pack of zombies were waiting for them. Atticus lowered his shoulder, knocking down several of them to clear a path as they ran towards the next house. They bypassed it completely, getting out to the front to find a wall of ghouls standing between them and the exit. They'd have to go away from the edge of town. Come on, a couple more blocks, Atticus said, leading the charge. They pushed on, running hard and darting around zombies while attempting to remain as quiet as possible. They got a couple of blocks away, taking up cover behind a house when they heard the engines of the SUVs revving up. They gripped their weapons tightly neither ready to go down without a fight. But the sound faded, replaced by only moans. Let's get inside and regroup, Atticus suggested. 
They looked around, and zombies were coming at them from every direction. They moved to the back door, and the ex-ranger broke out a small pane of glass to unlock the door so they could get inside. He secured the door as Madison did a quick sweep of the two-story house, finding it empty. However, the front door was ajar, and zombies were coming up quickly. She made a run over to it, trying to close it, but a zombie managed to wedge itself into the gap. Its flailing arms made it difficult for her to shove it out. She jammed her hand against its chest, but the ghoul slapped her away. She tried again, but by that point it was too late. A small pack pushed up behind it, and she wasn't strong enough to hold them off. She backed off, yelling, They're inside! as the door smacked open. Get upstairs! Atticus barked. They broke away, running to the stairs and darting up to the second floor. They looked around frantically, trying to find something they could use to block off the stairs, spotting a tall bookcase against the wall. Atticus! Madison cried, motioning wildly to it, and they ran for the furniture, grabbing it and dragging it along the floor. They tipped it over, sending it careening down the staircase. The heavy bookcase slammed into the first few zombies, sending them flying backwards into the growing mob on the first floor. Luckily, the bookcase caught on the banister, turning slightly and wedging itself against the wall. For a brief moment, it held the ghouls at bay. Let's get some more furniture on the staircase, Atticus suggested. You want to stay here? Madison snapped. At least long enough to figure out what we're doing, he replied. They glanced out of one of the second floor windows at the hundred zombies gathering around them below in the yard. I'll take that room, she said. You take the next. Atticus nodded and they got back to work, scrounging for anything that could be used to block off the stairs. Chapter 2 About five minutes had passed since the duo had escaped the assault and been plugging up the stairwell. They had numerous smaller pieces of furniture clogging up the stairs, as well as a few mattresses placed at the end, wedged in between the railing and the wall. Once they were in place, Atticus took a couple of brooms he'd found, snapped off a bristle part, and jammed it in between the top step and the mattresses. You think that's going to hold them up? Madison asked, sounding skeptical. Even if it only buys us a couple of minutes, I'll take it, he replied. Fair enough, she agreed. The duo walked around the top floor, looking out every window and seeing zombies on the ground below them. The mob was about ten to fifteen creatures deep in some spots, but it seemed to be thinning out behind them. I think if we can get past the first wave, we can put some distance between us and the horde, Atticus said. Madison sighed. Great, maybe they got a hang glider in the closet, she joked. Outside of that, do you have any ideas on how we're getting out of this one? he asked, pointing to the stairs, because I don't think going out the front door is going to be an option. She gritted her teeth. Fresh out of ideas at the moment, she grunted. Let's keep looking. Maybe we can find a weak spot, Atticus suggested. They continued walking from window to window, looking out and hoping to find a solution to their problem before the mob downstairs could fight their way up. As they walked, Madison's expression got harder and more concerned. The first shred of actual worry Atticus had seen on her face since he'd met her. Don't worry, he assured her. I've been in tighter spots than this. We'll get out of here. That's not what I'm worried about, she said. Oh, he asked, raising an eyebrow. Care to share? I'm worried about the hostage, she said, voice clipped. What's his name? Atticus asked, gentling his voice. She sighed. Honestly, I don't know, she said. Couldn't see who they took. It's either Jean, Rick, or John. Those were the ones who were in the line of fire back in town. I don't know who survived. Don't worry. We'll get them back, he said. That's not what I'm worried about, she huffed. Honestly, if I had a shot, I would have taken him out myself. Atticus stared at her eyes wide with shock. I know you probably think I'm a horrible person for saying that, she admitted, shaking her head. But we're at war, and that man has vital information. Now he's in the hands of an enemy with the means to extract it from him. What information could he possibly have that would be worth ending his life over? The ex-ranger asked. 
Your hideout? You honestly think they don't know your location by now? They're the military. They're trained to know this stuff. Madison nodded. Oh, I know. I've worked with them extensively with my day job. Intelligence gathering, counterintelligence, infiltration. She took a deep breath. The whole nine. And yes, I have no doubt they know where we are. In fact, we've made no secret of it. It's down in Great Bend, about 250 miles south of here. Oh? Atticus said slowly, brow furrowing. Well, what are you worried about then? A few weeks ago, we had a defector within their ranks come to us, she explained. Not just with information, but with a truckload of heavy-duty weaponry. I'm talking 50 cal machine guns and other showy stuff. Unfortunately, he didn't have any ammo for it. It was still a hell of a gift, though. He nodded thoughtfully. It's like facing down a bear, he said. You know you're outclassed, but if you can make yourself look big and powerful, they won't know they have the upper hand. Exactly, she said, pointing at him. If they find out that the fifty cows we have guarding the city walls are just for show, they'll move in and wipe it off the map. Y'all have been causing them that much trouble? Atticus asked, sounding impressed. Oh, you have no idea, Madison drawled. They continued to walk around, looking out windows. Madison stopped and looked down the street, pointing to an old pickup truck sitting in the driveway. I think we found our ride, she said. Assuming we can find the keys, Atticus said, looking over her shoulder. And, you know, get to it. She shook her head. Don't need the keys, just a screwdriver, she said. Oh, you gonna hotwire that bad boy? he asked, blinking at her, impressed again. Your tax dollars at work, she said, batting her eyelashes. All right, let's figure out a way to get over to it, he said, clapping his palms together. Bait them on the other side of the house, she suggested. Maybe clear them out enough so we can drop down and make a run for it? Worth a shot, Atticus said with a nod. They walked back over to the other side of the house, raising the window, and began smacking the side of the house to get the attention of the ghouls below. So, you got a big community to protect? Atticus asked, raising his voice so they could converse and also bait the zombies at the same time. Big community, yes, Madison replied, tilting her head back and forth. For me to protect? She shook her head. No, I'm not the leader. Hell, half the people in town don't trust me. They still think I'm some big government type that's there to spy on them. He smirked. You telling me that you aren't big government? He drawled. Oh, I absolutely am, she said with a laugh. I'm just not there to spy on them. I have my mission, and that comes first. But you still care enough to protect the town, Atticus asked. And my source within the ranks of the deserters, she added. Plus, all my stuff is back in town, and you know, it's a pain to rebuild. They shared another laugh, continuing to bang on the side of the house. So, what's your verdict on me? Atticus finally asked. You think I'm on the level? You risked your life to try to get my man out of harm's way, Madison said seriously. Yeah, I'm inclined to trust you. Plus, with the way you got your ass kicked, it was rather convincing. Don't think you would have allowed a beat down that bad if it was staged. Hey now, I got in a few good licks too, he protested, foe outraged. The two of them laughed some more, let out some more whistles, and continued to try to draw the zombies to their side of the house. So, what's the plan once we get to the truck? he asked. Be going after him? No, we're going to need reinforcements, she said, shaking her head. He nodded thoughtfully. You know where they're taking him, then? he asked. Yeah, she said. They have a satellite base in Holdridge, a hundred miles or so to the east of here. What about your man? he asked. We're just going to have to hope he can hold out long enough for us to get there, she said, eyes far away. Atticus nodded. So, where are we going? he asked. Great Bend, Madison replied immediately. Two hundred miles, he asked. Don't worry, with the way I drive it'll only be a couple of hours. Atticus laughed. That old beauty better have seatbelts, he said. Come on, let's see if we can move, she said. Atticus nodded and the two of them headed back to the other side of the house. 
They looked down at the ground, finding there were only a dozen or so creatures directly beneath them, spreading out fairly well. That's probably as good as that's going to get, the ex-ranger drawled. You game? Let's hit it, Madison agreed. How long do you need to hardwire the truck? He asked. We'll be gone in sixty seconds, she quipped. Okay, I'll watch your back, he promised, and motioned for her to take the lead. Madison opened the window as Atticus looked around the bedroom for something that might help. He spotted a silver picture frame with a family portrait in it and picked it up, feeling the weight behind it. Souvenir? she asked, cocking a brow. Distraction, he replied, shaking his head. It's got a good heft to it. Figured it might be able to reach the house next door. One loud thud might pull the ones in the immediate area away from the ground, she said, nodding as she realized what he was getting at. That's what I'm thinking, he said. Let's do it, she agreed, and he approached the window. He leaned out far enough that he could get a good range of motion with his throwing arm, and wound up a few times before letting the frame fly. They watched as it soared through the air, smacking into the next door house a few feet above the ground. The glass in the frame shattered, and it let out a moderately loud noise. They looked down and saw about half a dozen of the ghouls below were moseying away from the house to inspect the new sound. Just give it a second, and I'll lower you down, he said. Ladies first, huh? she teased. Such a gentleman. I got a little more height and reach than you do, he explained. Should cut off a couple feet on the drop. I'm just razzing you, she said, waving him off. I'll clear a landing spot for you. Come on. She climbed out the window, spinning around and grabbing Atticus's arm to steady herself. She glanced down and saw there was an empty spot just below her, with several zombies within a few yards of where she was about to be. She looked at Atticus and gave him a nod, and he lowered her down as far as he could, which was still a good couple of yards above the ground. She looked up and gave him a nod, and they both let go at the same time. Madison dropped to the ground and immediately went to work. She stepped to the side, shoving one of the creatures away with enough force to drop it to the ground. She pulled out a knife and started jabbing at heads, taking out a couple of them, while moving away from the house. Atticus quickly climbed out, holding onto the windowsill and lowering himself down as far as he possibly could. He stretched and let go, tumbling to the ground. He managed to brace himself against the house so he didn't get to the ground. He drew his knife and turned to see Madison wreaking havoc on the ghouls in the general vicinity. Move, he barked. She shoved a creature to the side and the two of them ran towards the house with the truck, which was mostly clear of ghouls. As they got closer, their footsteps on the pavement echoed throughout the neighborhood. Moaning came from the area behind the houses, and as they approached the truck, several zombies emerged from backyards. Get the truck going, I'll handle them. Atticus instructed. Madison headed straight for the truck, trying the handle and finding it unlocked. She hopped in and used her knife as the tool to get the truck started. As she did this, Atticus stood guard around her side of the truck, his knife in hand and ready to strike. There were about a dozen ghouls around the truck, starting ten yards out and stretching back. Not wanting to get pinned down, he went on the offensive, rushing towards the nearest creature. He jammed his knife into its head and threw it to the ground before focusing on the next closest creature. He went into a stabbing frenzy, taking out several ghouls before rushing back to the truck. There were a couple coming around the front of it, getting a little too close to Madison. As he approached, he lowered his shoulder, driving into the side of the lead creature and slamming it into the front of the vehicle. This stunned it long enough for him to grab it and throw it back to the others. As he did this, a lone creature came around the back of the truck, and he ran to it, stabbing it in the head and dropping it to the ground. He turned and saw that the mob of creatures was still growing and getting closer to them, now within five yards. Gonna have to speed it up, he yelled. As soon as the words came out of his mouth, the truck rumbled to life. Madison jumped in the driver's seat and slammed the door shut. Get in, she barked. He leapt into the truck bed, smacking it a couple of times to let her know he was in. She popped it into gear and floored it, peeling out of the driveway and onto the road. 
She stopped once there was a bit of distance between them and the mini-mob at the house. Atticus jumped down and clambered into the passenger seat. You good? she asked. Yeah, let's get out of here, he said. She hit the gas, driving towards the edge of town where they had entered from. She was forced to make a hard left turn when several dozen creatures poured into the street from the house they'd previously been at. The road running parallel with the edge of town was packed with creatures as well, forcing her to weave in and out between them, not wanting to risk damage to the truck. After some tense driving, they hit a bit of an open area. That road's clear, Atticus pointed out. She slammed on the brakes, backing up and looking down the side street, clear to the edge of town. Good enough for me, Madison said. They drove down the street, pulling off into the grass to get around the barricade at the edge before getting to the open area outside of town. Both of them were breathing hard, but they were relieved they'd managed to survive the ordeal. How are we looking on fuel? Atticus asked. Madison checked the gauge, tilting her head back and forth when she saw it was at less than half a tank. Going to have to stop and fill up, she said. That going to be a problem? he asked. She shook her head. Lots of farms between here and home, she explained. Plenty have private fueling stations with generators. We'll be fine. All right. Let's take a road trip, Atticus declared, pointing ahead. They drove along the outskirts of town and several minutes later hit the highway. Madison picked up the pace once she was on the road, pedaled to the metal towards the stronghold of Great Bend. Chapter 3 The sun set on the duo as they sped down the highway towards Great Bend. The talking had been minimal, and Atticus had been catching a bit of a nap, the soreness from his battle with the deserter starting to set in. As he woke up, he let out a bit of a groan. Doing okay over there? Madison asked, sounding a bit amused more than concerned. In my youth, I'd be raring to go for round two right about now, he grunted, scrubbing his hands down his face. She chuckled. And now? she asked. I think I'm content with the draw, he admitted. A draw, huh? she asked, her chuckle turning into more of a laugh. That's what we're calling it? Hey, we're both still standing, Atticus argued. That's a draw in my book. She shot him a teasing glance. Well, seeing as how you've had a rough day, I'll give that one to you, she said. Much appreciated, he said, finally shaking the last of his nap from himself. He sat up straighter, letting out another groan as he tried to get comfortable. He rubbed his arm and chest and then looked out the window, suddenly realizing how dark it was. How long was I out? Hour or so, Madison replied. Once we got back on the highway after filling up, you were out. Hope I didn't snore, he joked. She winked at him. Like I said, you've had a rough day, she teased, giving you the benefit of the doubt. He chuckled, shaking his head. Appreciate that too, he said, and finally stopped fidgeting when he found a comfortable spot. How far out are we? Ten, fifteen minutes, she replied. He glanced at the speedometer, noting that they were traveling well over a hundred miles per hour. You comfortable going that fast at night? He asked, trying not to sound too concerned for his own bodily safety. Why wouldn't I be? She asked, a little edge to her voice, a challenge. Zombies on the road, maybe? He replied. We're close enough to Great Bend that we're fine, she insisted. When the military was here in Kansas, they did a damn fine job keeping the undead population to a minimum. We've kept that up since they left. He raised a palm in surrender. Okay, I trust you, he said. Plus, there's nothing but farmland between here and home, she continued. So virtually every inch of land that touches the road has at least a barbed wire fence to it. It would take a hell of an effort for one of those things to get out here. Atticus nodded solemnly. Fully exposed, yet completely safe, he said. I like it. They sat in silence for a few more moments, and he stared out the window. Nothing but dark, empty space as they flew down the road. Can I ask you a question? He finally asked. Madison shrugged. 
Whatever you like, she replied. We got time. What kind of undercover work were you doing? He asked slowly. I mean no offense when I say this, but undercover wouldn't be the first assignment I would have guessed for you. She shrugged. And that's precisely the reason I was perfect for it, she said. Men look at me and they don't see a badass agent who can kill you three times before you hit the ground. They see an attractive woman and assume I'm harmless. I assume that worked in your favor, Atticus said. She nodded. Very much so, she said. Throw in my upbringing, growing up with a couple of brothers and a gearhead for a father, and I had the knowledge I needed too. Who were you investigating? he asked. I mean, as long as it's not classified. She rolled her eyes. Even if it is, who is going to come down and reprimand me? she drawled. He chuckled. Fair enough, he agreed. It was this mid-level gang working out of a Kansas City suburb, she explained. They had a few garages around the area and a junkyard just outside of town. Perfect spot to run drugs and women out of. Run women? Atticus asked, cocking a brow. Prostitution? Human trafficking, Madison corrected. He shook his head in disgust. Yeah, this would be a perfect spot for it, he spat. Similar situation in West Texas. Hundreds of miles of open land, one breakdown or late night rest stop, and somebody driving across the country goes missing. Yep, she said. Nobody had any leads because there's nothing around for miles. They had runners that would go out to their hot spots, kidnap the girls. Then they'd break them at the junkyard and ship them out like they were car parts. Were you able to finish the job? He asked. I mean, before all this got in the way. She shook her head. Was nearly finished building the case against them when I got reassigned, she said. Wasn't what I asked, he said, cocking a brow. She smirked. They're certainly not kidnapping anyone now, she replied. It's amazing, the freedom you get with frontier justice, Atticus said. I will admit it was satisfying, especially after being in their world for as long as I was, she said. He nodded. How long were you under? he asked. It doesn't matter, she said bitterly. Might as well be a lifetime ago. Tell me about it he said, laughing darkly under his breath. So what about you, cowboy? she asked, tone brightening a bit. How did Texas Ranger end up working for the new government in Seattle? He took a deep breath, leaning back in his seat. Right place, right time, he said. Or wrong place, wrong time, depending on your perspective. She barked a laugh. Sounds like me getting this gig, she said. I was actually retired, up camping near Seattle with my daughter when all this started, he explained. Managed to survive long enough to get to town. Me being the lucky man that I am was doing their interview process when they had a problem come up. Next thing I know, I'm back doing my old job. So this is your first assignment? she asked. Far from it, he replied, shaking his head. Having some issues with militia groups. She sucked in her cheeks for a moment before letting them go. How bad is it? she finally asked. If I had to guess, he asked with a shrug. Worse than they're letting on. Gotta love those higher-ups, don't you? Madison scoffed. It's always a need-to-know basis, and they don't share what you need to know until well past the point it would have been useful. Ain't that the truth? Atticus agreed wholeheartedly. I had this little weasel of a man who managed to get into a leadership position with the rangers. Don't know if he was politically connected or what the deal was, but he did not have the experience to have the job that he did. Got so bad with him that whatever info he would give me, I would automatically assume the worst-case scenario and proceed as such. She side-glanced him. That work? she asked. Still using that mindset today, he admitted. Well... Believe me when I say I'll be up front with you, she said, voice sincere. That's good to know, he replied. I'll go ahead and tell you right now, she continued. If we have to make a major offensive against these guys, a lot of people aren't coming back. He stayed quiet for a beat, chewing this over, and then sighed. 
Sometimes I miss the lies and letting my imagination do the work, he said, and they shared a laugh. There were lights in the distance, and about a mile from the town, two giant spotlights powered up, shining directly towards them. They're certainly on the ball, Atticus said. When you have an army gunning for you, you have to be on the ball, Madison said. She reached down and flicked the headlights on and off in what seemed like a very specific pattern. A few seconds later, the spotlights clicked on and off in another pattern. Impressive, Atticus said with an appraising nod. I like it. Just let me do the talking, she warned. Yes, ma'am, he replied, and mimed zipping his mouth shut. They drove up to the front of town, where a huge metal gate stood. It looked like it had been installed post-apocalypse over the highway. Half a dozen armed guards stood there, two in the towers on either side, weapons trained on the truck. As they stopped just in front of it, she poked her head out the window. It's Madison, open up, she said. The guards by the front gate swung it open, waving her through. She stopped at the gate. Where's Carney? she asked. She's at her house with a few of the others, the guard replied. So the other survivors got back okay? she asked. The guard nodded. An hour or so ago, he explained. Connie called a meeting to figure out the next move. The guard looked past Madison to Atticus, clenching his jaw and narrowing his eyes. New face, huh? Prisoner? The agent shook her head firmly. No, he's a friend, she said. The guard cocked his head. Been a while since we've had a new one of those around here, he drawled. We may have kicked the hornet's nest a bit, Madison admitted, so keep an eye out. The guard let out a chuckle and a sigh. Wouldn't expect anything less from you, Madison, he said and smacked the roof of the vehicle. She laughed as she rolled up the window and drove through the fortified town. There were camping lights in several of the buildings along the main road, with people sitting and reading, cooking and eating. Good to see people keeping busy. Atticus said as he looked around. She nodded thoughtfully. Town had a pretty decent library, so at least there's some entertainment for the people who can't help out on night patrols, she said. Thank God for small miracles, huh? He said. Madison chuckled a bit as she drove down the main street, turning onto a residential street and going for a few blocks before stopping in front of a modest single-story house. It couldn't be much bigger than 1,500 square feet, something that would have been a starter home for a young couple. Today, it was the home base to the Kansas residents. The duo got out of the truck, walking up towards the house that was bathed in light, inside and out. Two armed guards stood by the front door, and they stiffened as the guests approached. I'm still the talker, she murmured. Atticus nodded, hooking a thumb in his belt. Yes, ma'am, he agreed. Madison! You're still alive, one of the guards declared. Not for a lack of trying on their part, she replied. We need to see Connie. You can go in, but he has to wait, the guard said, inclining his head towards the ex-ranger. Madison raised her chin. He needs to come inside too, she insisted. The guard shook his head, but she stepped forward, glaring at him eye to eye, her voice lethal and authoritative. This man risked his life to try and save the hostage they took, she said. He also saved my life more than once today. That's all well and good, Madison, but you know that they're gunning for Connie, the guard replied apologetically. For all we know, he could be a sp You shut your mouth, she snapped. We are outmanned, outgunned, and are running out of time to prevent a catastrophe. This man is on our side, and we have information that Connie needs. Now get out of our way and let us do our jobs. The guard squirmed under her gaze, glancing over at his partner with wide, help-me eyes. The other guard gave him a slight nod, and he finally stepped out of the way. Okay, he huffed, shoulders slumping. Thank you, Madison said, straightening her shirt and leading Atticus into the house. The duo entered, and it was clear immediately that an argument was going on. There were three distinct voices coming from the next room, and Atticus followed Madison into what once was a dining room. Now it housed two men and a woman, 
heatedly arguing over a table with a map of Kansas lit by a camping light. We need to evacuate the town immediately, the oldest man said, his balding white hair looking barely there in the dim light. And go where? the younger man shot back, leaning his long and lanky frame against the table. Hell, forget that. How in the hell are we going to transport the hundreds of people to whatever magical place that those military assholes won't be able to find us? Tell me that one. The older man seemed to be formulating a response, but couldn't quite find the words as the other one stared him down. Finally, he backed down, shaking his head in defeat. Yeah, that's what I thought, the younger man snapped. Now start working on some real ideas instead of focusing on pure fantasy. And what's your bright idea? The older man demanded. We take a strike team and we go get our man back, the other one declared, stabbing a finger down on the table. Madison took this opportunity to announce their presence. And I suppose you know exactly where he is, don't you, Max? She asked loudly. The trio turned and looked at them, startled by the presence of two newcomers. The oldest man recovered from his shock first. Madison, it's good to see you, he said, sounding friendly, but tired. Mayor Williams, she greeted with a diplomatic nod. Who's your friend? the younger man asked with more than a little suspicion. Everybody, this is Atticus, Madison introduced, holding out a hand to the ex-ranger, who nodded. Former Texas ranger, now resident of the safe zone of Seattle, and currently in the employ of the government, or what's left of it. It's a pleasure, Atticus said. Mayor Williams broke away from the table, approaching him with an outstretched hand. Welcome to Grand Bend, he said as they shook hands. I'm Mayor Williams, and I handle all the civilian concerns. He motioned to the younger man. This firebrand here is Max. Welcome to the fire, Max muttered. Hope you didn't have to spend too long in the frying pan before getting here. And the young lady giving everyone the silent treatment is Connie Deacon, the mayor said. While she doesn't have an official title, she is the decision maker here. Atticus cocked a brow. Small town mayor taking orders, he drawled. That's a first. William shook his head with a grateful smile. I wouldn't be here without her, he said firmly. Most of us wouldn't be, in fact. The young woman got up from her chair and approached the duo. She had a short and stocky frame, a tomboyish figure, and hard-set eyes. Agent Madison, she said. Miss Deacon? Madison replied, just as sternly. The tension broke and evaporated as both women grinned, falling into a tight hug. Connie pulled back, holding Madison's shoulders as she looked at her. When the others got back and told us what happened in Wallace, I feared the worst, she said, eyes wide with emotion. When they couldn't find you, they thought you had been taken as well with Jean. She glanced at Atticus. But seeing as how you have a new friend here... I guess that wasn't the case. She extended her hand. Connie Deacon, so I have you to thank for Madison being here safe and sound? He nodded and shook with her. We watched each other's backs out there, he said. Well, if she trusts you, then I'm inclined to do the same, Connie said. Even if you are military. He shook his head. Not exactly military, ma'am, he corrected politely. Oh, you cut that ma'am shit out right now, she said, pointing a finger at his face. I'm not even thirty, and with the way things are going, it'll be an act of God for me to live long enough to reach an age where being called ma'am won't force me to resist the urge to grab the nearest blunt object and kneecap the son of a bitch who owns the lips those words escaped from. Madison smirked. Do you see why we follow her? She drawled. Oh, yes. She's my type of woman, Atticus agreed and put a hand over his chest. You have my apologies, Connie. Good, she said, clapping her hands together. Now that we have that out of the way, tell us what you know. We tracked the deserter to Curtis, which is where we made our move, Madison explained. Managed to disable his vehicle, but reinforcements got there before we could get to Jean. Not that it was for a lack of trying on our part, Atticus added, motioning to his bruises. Atticus got close, but reinforcements arrived, Madison said. The ex-ranger nodded. 
along with a few hundred of those things, he added. Any idea where they were taking him? Connie asked, putting a hand on her hip. They did one of two things, Madison replied, holding up two fingers. They either took him to a random farmhouse and extracted the info from him, which would mean we're too late and have to go with plan B, or they took him to Holdredge. The room fell silent at that for a few tense moments. He might as well be dead already, the mayor murmured hoarsely. Max growled, pointing a finger at him. You shut your pie hole, Williams, he snarled. That place is a fortress, the older man argued. Fortress might be a bit of an exaggeration, Madison said. It's stout, don't get me wrong. It's not going to be easy to get in. You said it was a satellite base for them, Atticus asked. She nodded. That's what my intel says, she replied. Yeah, your intel, Williams piped up, his voice a lot more snide than it had been since they'd walked in. Yet you won't tell us who's telling you this, or if you're just pulling it out of your ass. Loose lips sink ships, Madison snapped. I trust about three people at the moment, and given that there's four of you in this room, that should give you an idea of where my head is at. She let that sink in for a beat before continuing. Now, you can believe me or ignore me. I really don't care because it's not like you're going to be joining the fight. And since we're at the operational portion of the discussion, why don't you play 1950s housewife? Go sit in the corner, look pretty, and I'll tell you when I need something. Williams's face went beet red. But he didn't argue begrudgingly nodding in agreement before literally walking to the corner to sit in a waiting chair. Remind me to stay on your good side, Atticus whispered loudly. Trust me, it was deserved, Madison muttered. Okay, let's figure this out, Connie declared, and led the way to the table, tapping her finger on Holdredge. There's not a lot around the town, which is why they picked it. They're going to see us coming from any direction, which complicates things, to put it mildly. What about a diversion? Atticus asked. Get their attention focused one way, and we hit them from the other side. Max barked a humorless laugh. How many of us you want to sacrifice? He snapped. Nobody's getting sacrificed, Atticus replied calmly, shaking his head. And if you want me to lead the decoy group, I have no problem with it. Wouldn't be the first time. Connie took a deep breath. Having a decoy group is fine in theory, but where are we going to hold up? She cut in. If it's a hit and run, they're not going to pursue for very long before figuring out what we're doing. Holdridge isn't the biggest of places, but the strike team is going to need time to locate Jean. Wait, what about the grain elevator? Madison asked and traced her finger to the south of town, stopping on a small blip of a town labeled Clyde. What grain elevator? Max asked. There's a spot right along the train tracks where they load up the cars, she explained. Big-ass grain elevator and a warehouse on the other side of the highway. Connie raised an eyebrow. I know you're good, but how in the hell do you know this off the top of your head? She drawled. While the rest of you are kicking back at night and reading books, I'm doing recon on where our enemy is stationed. Madison replied with a hint of haughtiness in her voice. 99% of the stuff will never come in handy. But every now and then, here we are. What kind of shooters do you have? Atticus asked. More than you'd think for a bunch of civilians, Connie replied. Fair number of hunters in this group. And they're comfortable taking shots at humans? The ex-ranger asked. Connie raised her chin. I don't keep secrets in this community, she said sharply. Everybody knows what we're up against and they'll do what needs to be done. You look like you have a plan, Madison said, giving him the side eye. I just might, he said. Well, enlighten us, Connie invited, spreading her arms. Need a team of five or six, Atticus said thoughtfully. Your two best shooters, who are also fleet of foot, take position at the top of the grain elevator. Two more across the highway in the warehouse, and a rabbit to lure them into the briar patch. So the rabbit pulls a group of soldiers into the trap, they open fire and keep them occupied? Madison asked. He nodded. If they time it right and pick off a couple of them, they'll call for reinforcements, he explained. But as soon as that initial barrage happens, everybody needs to bug out. 
Multiple directions, just haul ass until they're out of harm's way. But is that going to be long enough to get into Haldrich and find Jean? Connie asked. He shrugged. It's going to have to be, unless you really want to sacrifice someone, he said gravely. How far away is that grain elevator? Max asked, still staring at the map. A couple miles at the most, Madison replied. He tilted his head back and forth as he did some mental calculations. Four minutes from initial assault to ambush, another minute of chaos, two more minutes to scramble another team, five minutes of pursuit time before they abandon, and another seven to ten to get back to town, he murmured. Maybe twenty minutes where they're in a weakened state, he added louder this time. I've done more with less time, Atticus declared. Problem is, we don't know what we're walking into. Madison raised a hand. I can help out with that, she said. Just need to stop by the bunker before we head out. You want to go now? Max gasped. No time like the present, she quipped. The darkness will give us some cover, especially for the decoy team to get away. And the longer Jean is in there, the more likely it is he'll talk, Atticus added. Connie cocked her head. Max, can you lead the decoy team? she asked. The younger man let out a deep whoosh of breath. Yeah, I can, he said, voice dejected. I'll pull my team and get them together. Madison, how many people do you need for the strike team? Get me two brawlers, she replied. Guys that can throw down in tight quarters. Max nodded. You'll have them, he said. Meet me at the gate in fifteen and we'll head out, she instructed. Connie skirted the table and held out her hand to Atticus. Good to have you on the team she said. He shook her hand, but shook his head. Afraid it's just for the night, he said. Max scoffed. Sending us to our deaths and running away, he drawled. Pretty standard with you military guys these days. Not running away from this fight, Atticus said firmly. I'm going to help you get Jean back, but I have my own mission to attend to. And believe me, you want me getting back in one piece. The younger man sneered. Oh, yeah? he asked. What are you going to do for us? I have some sway with the decision makers in Seattle, the ex ranger said, raising his chin. Based on what I've seen so far, I can convince them that this is a threat that needs to be taken seriously. That would mean supplies and reinforcements, unless you want to take these deserters on by yourself. Max's mouth opened and closed like a fish, but he didn't have a comeback. Finally, he huffed and shook his head, turning to the exit. I'll believe it when I see it, he spat over his shoulder. Fifteen minutes, front gate. Connie rested a gentle hand on Atticus's arm. You'll have to excuse him, she said with surprising emotion. He's had a rough go of it. All of us have, but especially him. No worries, I get it, Atticus replied, offering her a smile. If I were in his shoes... I wouldn't believe my words either. I look forward to seeing your return, she said, sincerity in her eyes and voice. Be safe, he replied. And Agent Madison? Connie continued, giving the agent's shoulder a squeeze. You come back in one piece too. I'll do my best, she replied. They shared a smile before Madison led Atticus out of the house. Come on, she said. The bunker is a couple blocks over. She smirked. I think you'll like it. Chapter 4 Madison led Atticus over to a dilapidated one-story house, which looked completely abandoned. Nothing like a fixer-upper, Atticus said as he took it in. Around back, Madison said and led him around to the back, where a set of stairs led down into a storm cellar. At the bottom, though... Instead of a rickety door, stood a heavy metal one with a digital keypad on it. She punched in a ten-digit code and the door clicked open. Wasn't expecting that, Atticus admitted. Benefits of having the agency chief issuing the orders, Madison said with a smirk. He knew I was going to be stationed here for the long haul, so he ordered the military to set me up. And it was just a hell of a coincidence that it happened to be in the town Connie decided to set up shop in. Atticus asked, cocking a brow. Madison's amusement deepened. I may have planted the idea in her head, 
she admitted, and motioned for him to follow her. As soon as the door shut behind them, the internal lights clicked on. It was a full bunker, with weapons on the wall, boxes of rations, papers and maps, and a computer against the wall, all powered on. Swanky setup, Atticus commended. Solar powered generator, Madison declared. Don't get a lot of juice, but enough to run things for a few hours every day. She went to the computer and fired it up. It only took a few moments for it to boot up, and she immediately got to work. She accessed a couple of folders, searching for the information she desired. Finally, she double-clicked on a document. There we go, she said. Let's see what we got here. They leaned over to look at the screen and read the document. Holdredge, Nebraska, Northern Satellite Outpost. Slated to be downsized after the North Platte recruitment is complete. Standing force of 60 to be cut by 75% after downsizing. Heavy weapons on highway and three strike teams on standby. That's some detailed information, Atticus mused. You got a man on the inside, huh? Madison nodded. Only other person who knows their identity is Connie, who was there when they were recruited, she said. Even being cautious with the pronouns, he pointed out, nodding appraisingly. I respect your dedication to your informant. It's nothing personal, she said. Oh, I know, he said, holding up a hand. I turned a number of them back in the day. Their lives were in my hands. If I said the wrong thing and the wrong person overheard, that was it for them. Just, if it looks like I'm about to shoot them, give me a heads up. She chuckled. Don't think it will come to that, she said. But I will let you know. He motioned to the wall of weapons. So, you mind if I borrow a piece? He asked. Kind of left my baby back in Wallace. Take whatever you like, she replied. There are mags ready to go in the drawers below. He nodded and moved over to the wall, looking at the variety of weaponry. There were shotguns, scoped rifles, and the one he picked was a modified assault rifle with a mid-range scope on it. He inspected it, nodding to himself. Yeah... This will do nicely, he murmured. Good choice, Madison commended. Scope's night vision too, which might come in handy tonight. Atticus nodded and opened the drawer, grabbing a trio of magazines and stashing them in his pockets. I'm ready when you are, he said. Just need a minute, she replied, getting up from her desk. One more thing I gotta do. She walked over to a filing cabinet and opened it up digging through it for a few moments before pulling out a thumb drive. She walked back over to the computer and plugged it in, dragging a large folder to the drive and letting a copy sequence start. What you got? Atticus asked. Something I wasn't planning on turning over to anybody but the head of the agency, she replied. But it's been a couple of weeks since I last had contact with them. Don't know if it's a communication error. They're just busy with the situation in Seattle, or or if they're gone. The computer gave a happy little ding when the copy completed, and she ejected the drive before unplugging it and holding it out to Atticus. So, I'm backed into a corner. Against all odds, you fell into my lap and you have a direct line to the decision makers. While you are no doubt a persuasive talker, your word might not be enough to get your people to commit lives to the situation here. She smiled and pressed the drive into his palm. I'm hoping this will give you the intel you need to convince them. He stared down at the drive, nodding. What's on here? he asked. Every bit of information I've gathered since the start of this, Madison replied. All the major players I've been able to make out. Detailed reports on key events, and a running conclusion on what's going to happen if we don't get the help we need. Spoiler alert, it isn't good. I will guard this with my life, he promised. The drive is password protected, she continued. I used your name as the password. It's not encrypted like I would normally send it, but it'll do in a pinch. He nodded. Something's better than nothing, he agreed. Still, I'm going to guard it with my life. Speaking of your life, I have a proposition for you, she said. Atticus didn't much like the sound of that, but he nodded anyway. Okay, he said. I don't think we're all coming back from this raid, Madison admitted. And it's not the plan. In fact, it looks pretty identical to one I would come up with in this situation. 
It's just... She trailed off, shaking her head. A bunch of civilians going up against trained soldiers, Atticus supplied. She sighed and nodded. We're basically an insurgency at this point. We've scored some victories, she said, and pointed to the thumb drive, as you'll see. But it's come at a heavy price. If we can't get to Jean, we're going to be scattered in the wind because this place will be wiped off of the map. Which is why we're going to get him, Atticus said. She shook her head. We can handle it, even if it's a one-way trip, she said firmly. But if you don't get back with that information, then getting to Jean is just staving off the inevitable. It sank down on his shoulders what she was insinuating. You don't think I should go on this run, do you? he asked. She sighed, raising her gaze to his. I don't, she confirmed. We're all expendable. You aren't. You know the people going on this run? he asked. I do, she replied. Anybody even half as capable as me? he asked, cocking a brow. Hell no, she replied with zero hesitation. I didn't think so, he quipped. Look, you know I can handle myself. She blinked at him and motioned towards the bruises on his body from the last fight before crossing her arms. And you also know I can take a beating and continue kicking ass, he added. She chuckled. There it is, she muttered. How about this? Atticus asked, raising a hand. We'll get Jean out, and then you can escort me directly to my pickup spot outside North Platte. Deal? Madison chewed on the inside of her lip, hesitant, weighing how valuable he was in all situations. Finally, she nodded. Okay, she huffed, letting out a deep breath, before pointing a finger in his face. But you let me lead the way. He nodded immediately. She walked over to the wall and opened up a drawer, pulling out a bulletproof vest and tossing it over. And you're wearing that, she demanded. He caught it instinctively and opened his mouth to argue, but at the sight of her determined gaze and hard set of her jaw, he just nodded, slipping it on. That's not off-the-shelf stuff either, Madison added. That's war zone quality. It'll stop a rifle round. He cocked a curious brow. Wasn't aware the military was handing out the good stuff, he said. She wrinkled her nose. Okay, it's private contract of war zone quality, she amended. Atticus chuckled as he did up the last of the straps. Just try not to take a round if you can help it, she warned, because it hurts like a son of a bitch. Took a nine mil round a couple years back, he said gravely. Cracked a rib. Caught a rifle round during a raid. Laid me up for six weeks, she replied. Pretty sure I was forty percent bruise. Anticus finished up, giving the vest a playful smack. Okay, ready for battle, he declared. All right, let's go meet the team, she said, and led him out of the bunker. She secured it behind them, and they walked through the quaint little town, enjoying the brisk night air and the calm before the storm. As they approached the front gate, Three vehicles came into view. There was an SUV and two trucks. Max stood outside of it with a handle of men ranging in age from their early twenties to their late fifties. How are we looking? Madison asked. Max spread his arms. Got the best available men, he said. Got patrols going, and a team is out dealing with a conflict at one of the arms. Didn't sound like anything major, though. Walkies? she asked. Max nodded. Each team has one he explained. It's on your dash. Madison looked over to a couple of larger men that looked to be in their late thirties. They had handguns strapped to their sides and were wearing brass knuckles. You my brawlers? Madison asked. Yes, the taller one said gruffly. I'm Eric, and this is my buddy Julius. She raised her chin. And you know how to fight? She asked. We were both bouncers at a BYOB strip club, Julius replied. Let's just say we weren't getting the upscale clientele, Eric added. She nodded firmly. I'm Madison, she said. That's Atticus. He is more valuable than any of us, understand? Yes, ma'am, Julius confirmed, and Eric nodded. Okay, let's load up, Madison said, motioning to the vehicles. How you want to play it? Max asked. She checked her watch. 
It's 1 a.m. now, she said. Going to take a couple of hours to get up there and get situated. You come up from the south and get set up in Clyde. We're going to have to prep from the west. Make sure our escape route is clear. Four o'clock to kick things off? Max asked. She tilted her head back and forth. Make it 4.30, she said. That gives us a couple of hours to get in and out. Okay, we'll see you on the other side, Max said with a nod and extended his fist. Madison bumped it with her own and then whirled her hand above her head. You heard the man. Let's load up, she barked. Everybody got into the vehicles, Madison and Atticus getting into the front of the SUV with their brawlers in the back. Everyone buckle up, she instructed firmly, because I don't believe in speed limits. Atticus did so and glanced into the back seat. Trust me, she doesn't, he said gravely. The two men looked at each other and shared a nod, clicking their seat belts into place. The front gate opened up and they sped out into the night, headed towards the fight of their lives. Chapter 5 The drive went smoothly and quickly, with everyone in the SUV completely silent. Some of them were focused on the task ahead, and others caught a bit of sleep since it was the middle of the night. Atticus was wide awake, however, too wired to rest, scanning the horizon for any trouble. You good over there? he asked. You don't have to ask me every five minutes, you know, Madison joked. You've been up for God only knows how long, going ninety down a dark road, headed towards a group of trained killers who would love to add our heads to their trophy case. He counted firmly. Just want to make sure you don't need me to drive. She smiled wanly and nodded. I'm good, she said, her voice gentling in appreciation of his concern. This is a walk in the park compared to some of the assignments I've had to run. Little sleep deprivation and a quaint drive through the heartland of America. I can handle that. How about Max up there? Atticus asked, inclining his head. He seems like a can-do kind of guy. Madison took a deep breath. At first, I didn't think he was cut out for this, she admitted. But he's proved me wrong enough times that I've stopped doubting him. Nothing like a little baptism by fire, the ex-ranger agreed. I think we all go through that at some point or another, if we're in this life, she said wistfully. Only so much that training can teach you. He nodded in agreement. Yep, he said. Everybody has a plan until the bullets start flying back in your direction. So for lack of a better term, what was your first rodeo? Madison asked, inclining her head towards him. He chuckled. Ironically, it was at a rodeo, he said. She shook her head, gaping. Get the fuck out of here, she blurted. And to God, it was at a rodeo, he insisted, raising his palms in surrender. It was this small town out in West Texas called McCamey. Almost smack dab in the middle between El Paso, San Antonio, and Dallas. Podunk little spot, only a couple thousand people, but big enough to have an airport. They ran a regional rodeo once a year to raise funds for the local fire department. She cocked a brow. What does a town that small need with an airport? She asked. Big energy town, he explained. Started out as an oil boom town, but started transitioning to wind farm technology. Guess all the high-level execs didn't want to make that five-hour drive through the middle of nowhere to check out their investments. They rarely do, she quipped. And sorry for the interruption. Please continue. He nodded his forgiveness. Well, my partner's cartel informant dropped us this hot tip that some enterprising young upstarts within their organization were planning on flying in some goods to the airport in McCamey, he said. Apparently, they had moved a big shipment across the border and were looking to speed up the distribution to the major cities. Cutting out half the drive would be a big plus in their books. She nodded slowly. Guess they didn't want the drive through nothingness either, she said. He chuckled. Apparently not, he said. My partner really wasn't too interested in it, since drugs weren't our thing. But the informant told us one of the fugitives on our list was going to be on the flight. We were only a couple hours away, so we figured why not. Worst case, we could catch the rodeo for a night and have a few drinks, and maybe introduce ourselves to a few local ladies. 
Madison rolled her eyes. A noble pursuit, she drawled. Chasing tail on the government's dime. Don't go judging now, Atticus said, wagging a finger at her. I was young, hot, and a Texas Ranger. Couldn't let that go to waste. Oh, no judgment whatsoever, Madison assured him. Might have partaken in that exact thing a time or two myself. He laughed. I knew I liked you, he drawled. So we get there the day before, and the informant says the plane is delayed until the next afternoon. Engine problems or something. So we decide to go have us a fun night on the town. Bit of a late night, partner calls it early, but I finally stumble back to the hotel a few hours later. She smacked. Alone? She asked playfully. Yeah, I like to do my walk of shame at night, he replied. She barked a laugh. My man, she said. So, not fifteen minutes after I get up, this pickup truck pulls up right in front of our room, high beams on and everything, he continued. I'm confused, so I open the blinds and look outside, and then a bullet comes through. My partner pulls me to the ground and they unload on us. Easily seventy or eighty rounds, just shredding the front of the building. She nodded slowly. So, how'd you react? she asked. I froze for a moment, not that it mattered all that much, because I wasn't moving off the ground with that much lead coming our way. But after a few seconds, I snapped out of it, drew my revolver, and worked my way to the door, he explained. As soon as the firing stopped, I flung that thing open and started unloading on them. Partner did the same thing from what was left of the window. The driver took one right in the forehead, so the truck wasn't going anywhere. For effect, he poked his own forehead, right in the middle. My shots hit mostly air, except for one that winged one of the gunmen in the back. The others fled on foot, and just as quickly as it started, it was over. So what happened? Madison asked. We cleaned up the mess, interrogated the one I took down, and was able to round up the others relatively easy with the help of the local badges, Atticus replied. She shook her head in surprise. But... How'd they know you were there? She asked. He sighed. Informant set us up, he said. He got careless, and his only chance at seeing the next day was setting up the hit. I can't blame him. Probably do the same in his position. Deep down, I kind of hope he got to see that surprise. Guessing he didn't get to see much more than that? Madison asked. He shook his head. I doubt it, he admitted. He was found three weeks later. Well, most of him, at any rate. She scoffed. Those cartels, man. Zero chill, she said. Oh, I have stories, Atticus drawled. I bet, but I have to say, I am a little disappointed in this one, she admitted, letting out an overdramatic sigh. Oh, yeah? he asked, cocking a brow in shock. Why's that? You were at a rodeo, she said. Where's the part where you're riding down the street on the back of a horse shirtless while shooting at a perp? He held up a finger. Well, in my defense, I haven't told you about the apprehension of the two that fled, he insisted. They laughed, but it cut short when Atticus spotted something out the passenger window, far in the distance, on a side road that intersected with the highway they were on. He spotted a slight reflection bouncing off of a windshield of a rapidly moving vehicle. Binoculars, he snapped. What? Madison demanded. Do we have binoculars? He asked forcefully. Glove box, she said, inclining her head. Night vision ones. He tore open the glove box and ripped them out, raising them and honing in on the target. As he looked, Madison reached for the walkie on the dash, but didn't speak into it yet, waiting to be able to relay proper information. Atticus gritted his teeth as he spotted an SUV running without headlights, screaming down the road to intercept. It's a patrol, and they spot us, he said. Max, we're spotted, Madison barked into the radio. Headlights off. A split second later, the headlights on the lead trucks went off. I want you to double back to the crossroad a couple miles back, Madison instructed. We'll handle the patrol. What about the timeline? Max came back. She glanced over at Atticus and he shrugged. At 30, he suggested. You started up at 5, she said into the radio. Copy that. Good luck, Max replied. 
and the two trucks in front of them got into the other lane, slamming on the brakes and doing a quick and efficient three-point turn in the road before hauling ass the other way. What's the plan? Atticus asked. You're going to get their attention with that weapon I gifted to you. Then we're going to turn off at the next farm we see, she instructed. You two in the back. Up and at em, boys. You got some hell to raise. What's going on? Eric asked, rubbing his eyes as the two of them jerked awake. Company coming in hot, Madison said. Atticus pulled up the assault rifle and rolled down the window, looking through the night vision scope and tracking his target. At their current speed, the enemy vehicle would reach the intersection before they would. You need to speed up, he said. How much? she asked. Just keep going faster, he shot back. I can do that, Madison promised and floored it, picking up a lot of speed on top of their already racing pace. Atticus kept his gun trained on the vehicle, waiting until they were within fifty yards of each other before pulling the trigger. He timed it perfectly, firing several rounds as they screamed past the side road. He wasn't sure if he hit anything, but the bullets did their job as the SUV turned in their direction and began following them. That got their attention, he quipped. Bullets impacted the vehicle, one of which plowed through the back window. The two men in the back ducked down as much as they could, and Atticus tried to aim over them. Don't you dare shoot inside this vehicle, Madison warned. Use the sunroof. She hit the button, and the X-Ranger got ready, bracing himself before popping out of the roof and taking aim at the pursuing vehicle. He exchanged fire with them for several moments before he felt a smack against his leg. He glanced down, and all he could see was a hand signal pointing to the right. Oh, hell, he muttered, and braced as the vehicle decelerated and made a violent turn to the right. The tires squealed, struggling to get a grip, but finally did, and the SUV took off like a jackrabbit. He fired a couple more times as the vehicle drove right by them, hitting the back passenger window and shattering it, but he wasn't sure if he hit anybody. The team tore down the driveway of a farm, which led up to the main house and out two buildings. They got a couple hundred yards down the driveway before the former soldier's vehicle was able to turn around and pursue them. You got a plan? Madison asked. Attica shrugged. Sort of, he asked. She nodded. I'll take it, she said. I'll get on the second floor and start shooting, he said. They'll get in the house and you three go to work. That definitely qualifies as a sort of, kind of plan, Madison muttered. We'll make it work, Eric said firmly. She nodded. We'd better, she warned, and drove up to the house, stopping just a few yards short of the front porch, but off to the side so the stairs were still accessible. She parked sideways so that the passenger side was facing the house. The two brawlers got out on that side, concealing their presence from the oncoming threat. Atticus ran to the front door, turning the handle, surprised when the door just opened. He rushed inside, sweeping the few rooms he could see from the front door. There were a couple of zombies in the dining room. Three o'clock, he barked. On it, Eric said, and he and Julius rushed over to the creatures as Madison secured the front door. Both men picked their targets, walked over and grabbed them by the throats. The ghouls thrashed about, trying to break free from the grip and feast on living flesh, but to no avail. Both men forced the smaller creatures into the kitchen, which was clear of zombies. They each grabbed an object with their free hands, Eric a cast iron pan, and Julius a toaster, going to work smashing the creatures' heads in violently. Several cracks later, their brains were mush, and the corpses dropped to the tiles. Rest of the floor is clear, Madison said, and glanced at the dead zombies. Now just do that again to those guys, and we can be on our way. Both brawlers grinned widely, giving her an affirmative nod. Atticus, meanwhile, rushed up the stairs, spotting a couple of zombies coming around to the top of them, attracted by the noise below. He didn't hesitate, squeezing the trigger and ripping their heads off without breaking stride. He reached the top, quickly sweeping the top floor common area, but not seeing any more creatures. The rest of the doors upstairs were closed tightly, so he didn't have to worry about checking them. He ran over to the front window, looking out just as the SUV of ex-soldiers pulled up about thirty yards shy of the building. Four men got out and took position behind it. Atticus peered through his scope, 
taking stock of the situation as they got situated. They ducked down out of sight, but he could see the broken window he'd shot out. One man was slumped over to the seat, a splatter of blood coating the inside of the vehicle. He waited a few moments, seeing if they were going to make a move or not, and then got impatient, sending a few rounds their way, the bullets ripping through the top of the SUV. It only took a split second after that for the ex-soldiers to pop up and return fire. There were two of them, each on the far end of the vehicle, and their aim was spot on. The bullets tore through the glass, shredding the wooden front of the house. Atticus kicked off the floorboard and fell backwards, sliding on the ground and taking cover. He figured his shots must have angered the soldiers because they were unloading on him. Easily twenty or thirty rounds blew apart the spot he'd just been standing in. Finally, the firing calmed down, and he quietly recovered his position by the window. He looked out just in time to see three of the four soldiers vanishing underneath the front porch overhang. Back at the SUV, the last remaining gunman stood up to take another shot. Atticus was a hair faster on the draw, squeezing the trigger and sending a kill shot towards the man. A spurt of blood went up as the bullet went through the man's neck, dropping him to the ground. Meanwhile, on the first floor of the house, the trio of ex-soldiers prepared to breach the front door. The lead man kicked it in, and his two partners rushed inside. As soon as the first one crossed the threshold, Madison opened fire from the living room to their left. She rapidly pulled the trigger of her handgun, getting decent grouping on the leader attacker. A trio of bullets smacked into his chest, stopped by his protective vest. Even though his life was spared, he hit the ground in an immense amount of pain. Before she could target the other two, the second man through the door opened fire as he darted into the dining room to his right. Madison took cover behind a doorframe, which was splintered by the attack. The deserter's attention was focused on Madison, so he didn't know what hit him when he ran directly into Eric. The large man brought his arm down in a chopping motion, right across the arms, knocking the assault rifle free. With his other hand, Eric grabbed the smaller soldier by the back of the head, driving him face first into the wall, smashing a glass picture frame, which shattered, sending shards of glass into his face. The soldier managed to fight back, swinging low and catching Eric in the gut, but it wasn't with anywhere near enough force to get the brawler to let go. Eric continued to smash the man's face into the wall, dragging it along as he flailed about helplessly. Finally, he dragged him over to a standalone shelf that was nailed to the wall. The man was in a bit of a daze at that point, helpless to prevent what was about to happen. Eric sneered. Say good night, he said, and pulled the man back to get as much momentum as he could before driving his face directly into the bookshelf. Even with the gunfire in the other room, he could hear the bones in the face snap and shatter. After several smashes, the ex-soldier went limp. He dropped him to the ground, giving the man's head one more solid stomp underneath his boot just to finish the job. In the other room, Madison exchanged gunfire with the last remaining soldier, who was still standing. The bullets coming from his assault rifle were plentiful enough that she was forced to retreat into the next room, allowing him to get in through the front door. She sent a few more shots in his direction while retreating, diving behind a couch and flipping it over, taking up a defensive position behind it. The soldier poked his head around the corner of the other room, finding Madison. You know that couch isn't going to provide much cover, he drawled. Don't need it to, Madison snapped, and before he could respond, Julius came around the corner from his hiding spot. He grabbed the barrel of his assault rifle, holding it down and away from his body, as he moved in for the kill. The deserter tried to reach for his sidearm, but before he could, Julius delivered a vicious punch to the bridge of his nose, breaking it and stunning the man. The brass knuckles on his hand did an immense amount of damage, leaving the other man unable to fight back. He punched him a couple more times, pinning him against the wall to continue his assault. Before too long, the man's face resembled ground beef, just beaten into a pulp. Julius let up, and the lifeless body collapsed to the ground. You good, Madison? Julius asked. Just fine, she replied, jumping to her feet. Let's get that one at the front. 
As the two of them moved back towards the front of the house, they could see a wounded ex-soldier struggling to aim his rifle in their direction. They retreated slightly, but it was unnecessary as a shot went off from upstairs. Atticus sent a rifle round towards the man, hitting him in the vest again. The ex-soldier dropped his gun and groaned in pain. We're clear, Atticus called. If he so much as twitches, I'm unloading on him. He walked over, kicking away the gun and disarming his opponent completely. Eric entered, tapping the ex-ranger on the soldier to get him to move so he could pick the captive up. Where do you want him? he asked. Get him in the chair, Atticus instructed. I want to have a chat with him. The wounded man groaned as he moved into the living room and plopped roughly down into a seat. As he hit the chair, Atticus turned to Julius. I'm pretty sure I got the man outside. Can you confirm it? he asked. Sure thing, the larger man replied with a sharp nod. And be careful. I think it was a kill shot, but it might be a slow one, Atticus warned. Julius nodded and headed out of the house. Eric stood behind the chair, keeping his big hands on the wounded man. He leaned down, speaking loud enough for all to hear. I don't have anything to restrain you with, but you and I both know I can throw you around this house like a rag doll without breaking a sweat, he warned, voice dripping with lethal venom. So unless you want to have the most painful death imaginable, I suggest you sit very still with your hands glued to the armrests. Do you understand? The ex-soldier nodded jerkily. Yeah, he said, wincing in pain. Atticus waved Madison over. Would you like to do the honors? he asked. Don't mind if I do, she replied, and cocked her head when she saw a hint of a smirk on the deserter's face. I'm on a timeline, so I'm going to forego all of the formalities and get straight to the point, she said, nose to nose with her fresh prisoner. I'm going to ask you questions, and you're going to tell me what I want to know. If you hesitate, my friend here is going to break one of your fingers. If I think you're lying, my friend here is going to break a major joint. Think wrist or ankle. And if at any time you're disrespectful to me in any fashion, she paused, gently tapping the top of the man's pants, you can kiss your little buddy goodbye. Now I want you to look me in the eye and tell me if you think I'm bluffing. All bravado gone. The soldier stared at her with wide eyes, shaking his head. Good. We're already off to a fantastic start, Madison said, straightening up. Now, tell me about Holdredge. What? The ex-soldier asked shrilly, clearly panicked. What about it? Defenses. How many are stationed there right now? She said, whirling her hand in the air. I have no idea, the soldier stammered. She snapped her fingers. Eric... Let's start with a rest, she said. Wait, the soldier screamed. I really have no idea. We were on a recon mission down near Wichita, and we're on the way back. Madison held up her hand to stop Eric's advance. What were you doing in Wichita, she asked. Just taking stock of the situation down there, he said, quivering with fear. It's a big city filled with zombies, and the military put up fairly decent fortifications around it. At least on the major roads out of town, she said. Why would you need to take stock of the situation? I... The ex-soldier stammered. I... Madison snapped her fingers again, pointing to the soldier's right hand. Pinky, she said. Eric easily reached down and broke the man's pinky finger, as if he was snapping a twig. The deserter screamed in agony, writhing but not moving from his spot. Okay, okay he cried. They don't fill me in on the whole plan, but there are rumors. Go on, Madison said, clasping her hands together in front of her. They know where you are, and they're tired of you messing with them, he stammered. There's a few hundred thousand of those things in Wichita, and they want to flood western Kansas with them. She kept up a good poker face, but Atticus could see the little stiffening of her muscles as she asked her next question. When? she asked. I don't know, the prisoner moaned. When? she demanded, yelling the word. I don't know, he yelled back. Those barricades are solid, and it's going to take some work to get them down and get the mob marching. A week? Maybe two? 
Madison turned around, approaching Atticus and leaning in so they could speak quietly. If he's telling the truth, then we need to act now, she murmured. And you need to get back to Seattle. Forget about Jean. No, he replied firmly. We'll get him back, and then I'll go. It's too dangerous, she insisted. And honestly, a moot point if they free hundreds of thousands of those things and send them our way. He thought for a moment, pacing for a beat before an idea sparked. Okay, we need to do two things, he said. Let your people know that they're targeting Wichita so they can send a team down to defend the western roads out of town. And we need to get Jean back. Madison shook her head. No, we need... I know, I know. We need to get me out of town, Atticus cut in, and we will. But we can do all of this. Julius returned, wiping his hands off of the back of his pants. He's been taken care of, he said. Okay, here's what we're doing, Atticus said, turning back to Madison. We're sending Julius back to town so they can start making preparations. We'll get into calm range of Max. Tell him we're reversing roles. Reversing roles? she asked, shaking her head. We're going to be the decoys, the X-Ranger explained. We make some noise, get them coming our way, then haul ass towards North Platte. She chewed over this for a moment. And if they follow us the whole way? she asked. Then we lose them, he said with a shrug. We go through Wallace again and let those ghouls help us out. Or we carry them all the way to North Platte, which is partially overrun as well. She sighed. I don't like it, she said. You don't have to like it, he shot back. You just gotta roll with it. She thought for a moment before begrudgingly nodding and looking over to Eric. She waved him over, and as soon as he stepped away from the chair, she quick drew her handgun and put a round in the prisoner's head, stunning everyone. Jesus, Atticus finally said. We don't have time for hostages, and he knew too much, Madison said, holstering her gun again. Besides... Once you read what they've put us through, you'll be envious that you weren't the one to pull the trigger. He wasn't pleased with the events, but he wasn't exactly in a position to judge. He gave her a slight nod and let the conversation carry on. Eric, you heard everything he said, Madison continued. Take their vehicle and haul ass back to Great Bend. You tell Carney to get a group together, and you fortify every major road heading west of Wichita. I'm on it, the tall man replied. Julius raised a hand. What are we doing? he asked. We're going to go help them get Jean, she said firmly. The group exited the house, picking up a few weapons along the way. They quickly got into their vehicles and sped off in opposite directions. Their missions were different, but equally dangerous. And important. The End <laughs>